Hello and welcome. You're on Smart News Global. I'm Nitin Gokhale. One of the advantages of uh, being confined to indoors because of this uh, COVID pandemic and uh, the way it is affecting a large segment of our population is uh, the pleasure of uh, reading new books and catching up on rereading some of the old ones. And uh, in uh, this process, one of the new books that I've uh, had the privilege to read is uh, something that we're going to talk about today on Bookscom. So on Books Corner today, we have an interesting book, which I uh, actually read through in one sitting. And it uh, transported me back to uh, China of the 1980s. Uh, not that I had visited China in the 1980s, but uh, from what I'd seen in uh, movies and what I'd uh, read in uh, other books, uh, like uh, Nixon and Mao, for instance, there was a book by an American journalist which talked about the 70s. This book also transported me back to Beijing, uh, if not the entire China. And uh, we are privileged to have with us the author of that book, uh, Ambassador Vijay Gokhale, uh, India's former foreign secretary, uh, till January 2020. He's written this book, uh, a slim volume, uh, but an important and a very detailed take on what happened in Tiananmen Square uh, in April, May and June 1989 and how it impacted uh, both politics and policies of China uh, subsequently. Uh, Ambassador Gokhale, welcome uh, to the Books Corner. Thank you, Nitin. Thank you. In fact, um, I think I mentioned to you even on phone uh, when we were speaking that I uh, actually finished this book in one sitting of maybe about uh, four hours. Uh, it is so racy. It's like a, it's like a thriller in many ways, although it is rooted in uh, reality and the events that happened in 1989. So uh, the first question that came to my mind in, um, when I read the book and when I completed it, actually one of the notes that I made was, uh, and it's a striking aspect of this book, you have actually challenged the, uh, the Western uh, media narrative and the uh, Western uh, political as well as diplomatic narrative that was prevailing at that point when the Tiananmen uh, incident, I won't call it a massacre, although there is a tendency to call it a massacre, incident took place on uh, 4th June and of course the uh, events uh, leading up to it. Uh, what actually uh, was your uh, you know, take on the Western narrative and you actually said it in the book, but I want our uh, viewers to understand why did you challenge that narrative and it could be one of the points of criticism from the West of your book that may come uh, when they start reading your book in large numbers. Thank you, Nitin. Um, you know, uh, First, just let me explain a little bit about uh, how I wrote this book. Uh, obviously, it is an important turning point in China's domestic political situation and therefore it certainly warrants a greater interest on the part of all of us. But it was a question of using too much detail and also ensuring that the book was readable at the end of the process and therefore I had to weigh the detail against the readability of the book. And I think that um, uh, I was able to achieve that balance. And the comment that you made about reading the book at one sitting is a comment that a number of other people who have written to me after having read the book have also made. Now, uh, the, the fact of the matter was that one of the reasons I wrote the book, Nitin, was because most accounts of what happened in China in 1989 are, in fact, Western accounts. There are, of course, a few Chinese accounts as well. But in a sense, uh, both of them have certain biases. And my effort was to see if I could do uh, a book that was more objective, more balanced. Although I do admit that my own biases have obviously uh, been reflected as part of this book. Uh, to be fair, uh, I think the, the West looked at Tiananmen uh, in a very different situation from today's situation because as you and I will recall that was still the era of the Cold War. Nobody had anticipated the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of Soviet domination of Eastern Europe within six months of the Tiananmen incident. 
So in that sense, I think not just Western diplomats, but the Western media were also ideological. So I think there is uh, I, uh, uh, some amount of understanding that we need to show in the slant that the Western media took when, I, when, when this incident happened. But notwithstanding that, uh, my own sense is that there were many cases where second-hand information or unverified information was used in an effort to create a picture which, to my mind, was not really reflected on the ground. Uh, and I have given some instances in the book. There are a number of other instances did I, that I did not put there because uh, there was no sort of uh, evidence to back up uh, the, that observation. But, uh, for instance, I do mention in the book of one very well-documented fact subsequent to the event where a very, very senior American journalist who is a very prominent author on China uh, actually took uh, one of the main student leaders out for dinner at a time when the student leader was supposedly on a hunger strike unto death in the square. Uh, now, while this is a valid uh, uh, tactic for a media person, I think in the interest of full disclosure, the free press ought to have disclosed this, but uh, did not disclose this fact. So it is such uh, uh, situations which led me to the conclusion that the Western media was also slanted um, and was not entirely portraying the, the, the facts objectively. And you bring it out very well. In fact, uh, the, the biases and the, the slant that was there. And that was because uh, you were there personally. You could interact with people. You could mingle with people as a young diplomat. That was your first uh, posting in Beijing, if I'm correct. And uh, also it gave you uh, that time. I think there was a atmosphere of a bit of a freedom, which uh, now perhaps uh, or even earlier before the Tiananmen incident was uh, unthinkable in China. Was that the situation that it was easier for you to talk and uh, mingle with people, get their observations, get their comments, and make your own conclusions? Yes, I would in fact say, Nitin, that those 50 days were, at least in my almost four decades of dealing with China, the only time when the entire system was exposed and we could see the inner workings of the Communist Party. To that extent, um, there has been no opportunity since that time to really know what is going on inside the party at first hand. What we now read are uh, second-hand accounts or second-hand analysis, but with little appreciation of the facts. And therefore, I felt writing about it uh, was not only historically important, but equally it allowed us in a very contemporary setting to understand the party, which is not only still ruling China, but is more powerful than ever before. So therefore, there is both a historical and a contemporary relevance to this incident. And I felt that uh, it, it was deserving of, of a book, uh, which I hope that Indians will read, because we are 1.4 billion Indians who are neighbors to 1.4 billion Chinese. And therefore, our fates are linked to each other. Well, oh, indeed. In fact, uh, you uh, put it rightly and it is uh, reflected. The strongest part of the book, in fact, to my mind, uh, was the uh, inner workings and the inner party struggle uh, at the highest level, at the Politburo uh, Standing Committee level and uh, at the, uh, the next level uh, that you bring out so vividly. I think your observations on each of the leaders, each of the actors involved there, uh, from Deng Xiaoping to uh, Zhao Jian to uh, Lipang after that, I think uh, it sets the standards that uh, Indian scholars must now strive to uh, meet because, as you said, uh, we are neighbors, we are interlinked, uh, there is no getting away from China. And if we don't understand the inner workings of the party and which you bring out very well that it is not a monolith, at least it wasn't so at that point in time. So that, I think, is the strongest um, the point of your book uh, in that sense or the chapters that you uh, talk about. But uh, tell me, I mean, uh, Tiananmen incident, uh, also uh, changed the course of uh, China's politics as well as economics. Uh, if you can elaborate a bit on that, because that also you bring out in the uh, in the book. Yeah. So uh, as I um, uh, mentioned to you earlier last year, perhaps when you also did an interview on this subject with me, 
was that uh, we have to see the Tiananmen incident not simply as 50 days of uh, the Americans or the West would say a democratic upsurge and the Chinese would say a counter-revolutionary rebellion. We have to see it as 50 days in the decade of the 1980s, a decade which in many ways defined modern China because it bookended uh, at one side uh, the ending of the Cultural Revolution, which uh, even by official Chinese accounts seriously set back the People's Republic of China. And at the other end, the starting of the remarkable miracle that Deng Xiaoping and his successors have crafted in uh, taking the Chinese economy to the status of the second largest economy and perhaps soon to be the largest economy in the world within one generation. Uh, and therefore, understanding the Tiananmen incident in this context uh, uh, gives a whole new dimension to it of a determined leader who had to balance how much of economic reform and opening up he could allow because he understood that without that, China would never be um, uh, a major country. But without it spilling over into the political arena, and disturbing the rule of the Communist Party. And uh, all this while, he was watching the opposite experiment taking place in the Soviet Union, where Gorbachev was doing political reform ahead of economic reform. So in a sense, uh, while in hindsight, we might say that uh, China was correct, but I can only hazard a guess that when Deng Xiaoping was doing this, it must have occurred to him that these were two major communist powers taking diametrically opposite paths. And it uh, redounds to the credit of this leader that he stuck to his guns and uh, he had the courage of conviction to carry through his ideas, even if it meant making some political sacrifices. So I tried to bring all this out in the book, including the fact that Dung made political sacrifices because he took the nation's larger and the party's larger interest in mind and never lost sight of that. I think uh, he was always a, a, a very loyal party soldier, as you uh, mentioned in the book. Uh, Deng was, uh, in that sense, uh, always loyal to the uh, Chinese Communist Party and he always kept the party's interest uh, uppermost in his mind. And yet, he ushered in uh, the economic reforms, uh, but did not allow any political reforms. So, like you said, it was exact opposite. But uh, in the book, it also is very uh, clear that uh, you, uh, in a way, uh, admired his approach and in a way you call him the uh, creator of modern China. Uh, explain to us uh, a bit about his personality and what you thought uh, he did and how did he survive all the political struggles that he went through? Yeah, well, I think we, first of all, we can't judge him uh, based on our standards. We are a democracy. We are an open system. We have all the elements of a democracy, an independent judiciary, a free media, vibrant civil society, and so on. We have to judge Deng Xiaoping, to my mind, in the context of his environment and in the context of his uh, national situation. Yeah. But uh, if you look at it in that context, by the end of the 1970s, China was exhausted from almost... 20 years of political adventurism. First, the Great Leap Forward, where according to a number of uh, Western estimates, close to 20 million people starved to death in the three years between 1959 and 1962. And then, of course, the Cultural Revolution for 10 years that Mao launched only to ensure his own supremacy and to eliminate any opposition uh, to his power which devastated the country because essentially for 10 years the economy simply came to a grinding halt and some of the best talent of China either languished in prisons or in some cases died because of cruelty and, uh, and uh, uh, acts of torture and so on. So uh, Dung was faced with uh, the wreckage of a country and he had to not only pull China out of that wreckage but also put it on the path to development and while doing that to ensure that the absolute leadership of the Communist Party, which he firmly believed in and which he had grown up in politically, uh, was not compromised. 
today this might look easier than it was uh, uh, but at that time uh, dang himself was not entirely unchallenged there were a number of senior leaders as i have brought out in the book who had their own interests so dang had the elders they were called the elders they were called the elders so mm-hmm. dang had to first knit together a co- a political coalition within his own party who would back him he made compromises ideologically for the larger interest of keeping the country on the path to economic reform uh, he uh, made major reforms in the way in which the communist party governed itself so that they would never go back again to a one person rule where that one person may take them in the wrong direction and in that process of course Dang was the first to admit that he was crossing the river by feeding the stones. That he never had a grand plan. Uh, right. He had a, he had a strategy, but he didn't have a grand plan. Uh, so it was a method of trial and error, but one where he was determined to keep the country on course. And uh, I think by the end of the uh, decade, he was able to achieve that. Subsequently, in the early 1990s, he was able to. finally eliminate all the opposition to his economic reforms so that when he died in 1997 there was no doubt about the direction in which china was going for that reason i believe that while mao is the liberator and unifier of the country after 40 or 50 years of civil war the true maker of modern china is dang xiaoping indeed it comes out very clearly in the in the book and uh, in fact uh, he also took advantage of the uh, proclivity of the west which uh, chose uh, business over democracy and human rights uh, which also you uh, comment and write about uh, was that uh, something that uh, you could have anticipated uh, in 1989 when uh, tiananmen happened or uh, it sort of subsequently uh, unfolded itself uh, what's your view on the western uh, approach to it i think more or less when the tiananmen incident itself was happening uh, there was a good understanding uh, within the indian embassy and by indian diplomats that uh, that china would be able to manipulate western thinking by then uh, china had already started to attract foreign investment and the western businessman was uh, testing the huge business opportunity or potentially huge business opportunity in china and when we learned uh, a few weeks later of a secret visit from the united states to china which i make up of which i make a mention in the book i think right. it became clear to us that um, uh, america would cut slack uh, for the chinese uh, because they had larger strategic objectives to fulfill not only Uh, because the soviet union was their main foe but also because uh, this offered enormous economic opportunities as the most populous country in the world and therefore the largest potentially largest consumer market uh, in True. that sense uh, uh, i think dang masterfully exploited uh, the mm-hmm. americans and the europeans basically by allowing them to hear and believe what they wanted to hear and believe. Uh, and uh, his entire uh, foreign policy philosophy of lying low and biding time was precisely that and that is why i do uh, towards the end of the book say that if today china has become a true challenger to us hegemony it is both because of the extraordinary hard work of the chinese people as much as the grave misunderstanding and misperception with which the west dealt with china and therefore the responsibility lies with both not just yes. with, not just with the chinese with uh, the chinese of course did an excellent job of duping the the west but sure. the west allowed itself to be duped for money i think so i think that comes out very clearly one final thought i think that's a side show in the book but uh, interesting again that uh, uh, bo shilai's father and xi jinping's father were also part of that uh, uh, the elders and uh, part of the uh, people who were uh, sort of important uh, politburo mem- or important members of the top leadership uh, during tiananmen and uh, the power struggle then uh, also ensued uh, maybe uh, in 2012 and gdp came out top that i think is a very uh, little known fact which you bring out there uh was was there rivals at that point in time uh, father of xi jinping and father of bo shilai 
Uh, I don't think there were rivals within, but what is interesting is that among all the elders, President Xi Jinping's father was the only one who uh, did not uh, lend his support to the uh, 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 to Deng's act of suppressing the uh, Tiananmen Square incident. By then, uh, 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 Xi Jinping's father had retired to the southern part of China. And we don't know why he stayed out of it, but we do know that he stayed out of it. Now, right. what is interesting in the last couple of uh, years, or maybe in the last one year, is that uh, two of the uh, uh, people who were involved in that decade uh, and who were subsequently sidelined uh, have been partially rehabilitated by Xi Jinping. So, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, Xi Jinping... Um, uh, 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 came out in support of Hu Yaoba, uh, the disgraced general secretary uh, in 1987. And it is presumed that he has done so because Hu Yaoba played a major role in uh, bringing back from disgrace a number of the top leaders, including Xi Jinping's father, Xi Chongshun. Perhaps in appreciation of gratitude, this was done. But much more recently, Xi Jinping has also spoken in positive terms about Hua Gofang, the Indian mm -hmm. leader between, after Mao died and before Deng took total control. Uh, and there again, it is interesting that uh, uh, Xi Jinping has done so. Uh, and I think the message there is that so long as uh, they were loyal to the party uh, and they insisted that the party comes before everything else, even if they made mistakes, it is still something that the party should respect because the danger to the party comes from those who don't believe in the party, not those who believe but might make mistakes. So in that sense, I think this is this is important. Yeah, in fact, uh, that is what uh, it comes out to very clearly in the book. And I urge uh, everyone who uh, wants to be uh, a student of China and uh, contemporary as well as historical China to read this book. It could be a starting point uh, for your research and for your interest in uh, China. And I think one final question to you. Do you think uh, in India we need more scholarship on China, more study on China, more research on China? Oh, without a doubt. I think that we have, uh, we uh, uh, tend to uh, look at Western sources uh, and increasingly also Chinese sources for information on China uh, or for information on China's relations with other countries as well. And I don't think that we can, as a, a very large neighboring country with a whole host of problems, historical and more recent, depend on second-hand information and second-hand advice. Uh, I think the Indian public needs to uh, get more involved in knowing about China. And one reason I wrote this book in the very easy style of reading was because I did appreciate that it becomes difficult for an average Indian reader to read a very academic or heavily researched book. Uh, it, it has to be something that can be absorbed easily by the common person uh, and not something where you really need to apply your mind or to have deep information. And therefore, this book was written with that in mind, with the ordinary Indian citizen in mind, not with, not, uh, with the researcher or the academic or the policymaker. And I therefore hope that uh, uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, the average Indian will uh, pick up this book and read it. And I'm quite sure they will enjoy it. I, I'm, I'm sure they'll enjoy, not only enjoy it, but they'll absorb it. They'll also take lessons from here. And I'm with you on uh, what you said, that it, it is to be written for common Indian. Because I, I have something uh, common with you on that uh, front. Because I have also written my books uh, to be absolutely easy reads. And I believe that unless more and more common Indians uh, read history, politics, strategy, and our neighbor's history, uh, I don't think uh, India can really uh, sort of uh, understand the neighborhood or uh, the big nations like China. Thank you for writing this book and thank you for your time in chatting with me on Books Call. Thank you, Nitin. Thank you very much. Pleasure.